Hello everyone, and welcome back for another Iceberg video. This time, we'll be looking at the most recent single-player Fallout game, Fallout 4. We'll be covering all types of things as we go down the Iceberg, from characters and missions to cut content and easter eggs. I assume you all know what Fallout is and what Fallout 4 specifically is, but if not, it's essentially a post-apocalyptic RPG with a 1950s aesthetic that's filled with mutated creatures, Roman gangs, and a lot more. I also recommend checking out my classic Fallout Iceberg that I made before this as well if you want to learn more about Fallout and the older Fallout games. There will definitely be spoilers for this game ahead as well. This game did come out about a decade ago at this point, but it is so jam-packed full of stuff that perhaps there will be spoilers for a large amount of you people. But without further ado, let's get into this iceberg and begin Tier 1. Starting Tier 1, we have Factions. Fallout 4 is composed of four main factions that the player has the option of siding with. The Minutemen, the Brotherhood of Steel, the Institute, and the Railroad. They each have different goals and ambitions as well, and the Minutemen just want to defend every person in the Commonwealth from harm, and are a call back to the real Minutemen of the 1700s. They are basically the neutral option for the outcome of the Commonwealth. The Brotherhood of Steel come from the Capital Wasteland after the events of Fallout 3. They want to gather and collect pre-war tech to keep it out of the wrong hands. They claim to want to protect humanity, protect them from what caused the Great War of 2077 initially, and also to protect humans from abominations such as super mutants, ghouls, and notably synths. The Institute is like the shadow organization that is what the player strives to meet for a large chunk of the game. They send out robotic androids or synths into the wasteland and are generally guarded as not being all that ethical. The Railroad is probably the least sided with faction out of the main four, and their main goal is to free and liberate synths that the Institute created. They see them as equal to humans and want to get them safe from the control and the domination of the Institute. Next up we have synths. Synths are the creation of the Institute in Fallout 4, and they are robotic humanoid beings that come in differing forms. There are three main generations of synths, ones that are nothing more than what one would think of when it comes to robots, all the way to ones that are near indistinguishable from humans. Generation 1s are the basic ones, Gen 2s look more like humans but are still clearly robots, and Gen 3s are the human looking ones. There are also, as far as I know, two synths that are sort of in between generations, and that is the possible companion of Nick Valentine and Dima, a synth in the Far Harbor DLC. Synths are generally very disliked by humans in the Commonwealth, besides the Railroad, and the Institute will abduct real humans and replace them with synths without people knowing, further driving paranoia and fear up in the wasteland. Nate and Nora refers to the canonical real names of the two protagonists that you can play as in Fallout 4. Nate, a soldier before the bombs fell in 2077, fought at the Battle of Anchorage, while Nora was a lawyer. If the player decides to play as one, then the other one will ultimately be killed in a cutscene in the vault you two escape to in the prologue of the story. That vault, Vault 111, uses cryogenics to freeze people and keep them alive for long periods of time. That is, until the Institute gets involved and steals your son. Nate and Nora are the common names for these characters, but if you guys are on the internet nowadays, Nate is commonly known as John Fallout. Hell yeah. Kill Your Son or Nuke Boston was basically an attempt at a spoiler for Fallout 4 before it came out. I'm not sure how it was started, but basically it was the entire plot of the game supposedly shrunk down into just a few words. Also, the phrase is pretty misleading and also just wrong. I don't know why this was the thing everyone heard about the game, rather than nuke a specific spot in Boston while you kill your son, or instead of that, you can side with your son. Uh, I don't know. Fallout fans are weird, myself included. Bugs refers to glitches that are very common in basically every Bethesda game, not just Fallout 4, but basically every Fallout game in the franchise, and even not Fallout games. In Fallout 4, common bugs include quests just breaking and not being able to be completed, NPCs just becoming unresponsive, endless loading screens, things not showing up, and many, many more. The most common Bethesda bug is probably games just crashing, including Fallout 4, at completely random times. Companions refers to the fact that in Fallout 4, and other Fallout games, there are characters that you can take alongside you as you journey throughout the wasteland. There are 13 of them that can join you, and real quickly it is Kate, an Irish fighter who has a drug addiction, Codsworth, a robot butler that was with you before the war, Curie, a French robot who you can transplant into a synth body, Deacon, a synth who is able to change his appearance, Dogmeat, the well-known dog friend, Hancock, a ghoul who wears American Revolutionary Era clothes and is the mayor of Good Neighbor, Nick Valentine, a detective synth, Paladin Dance, a member of the Brotherhood of Steel who has a big secret, Piper, a journalist news reporter exposing corruption in Diamond City, Preston Garvey, the leader of the Minutemen before you join them, McCready, a man who returns from Fallout 3 who is a former gunner, Strong, a super mutant who likes Shakespeare, X688, an institute courser, Ada, a robot you meet in the Automatron DLC, Old Longfellow, a mariner who lives in Far Harbor, and lastly, Porter Gage, a raider who helps you take over Nuka World in the Nuka World DLC. Vaults refers to the fact that in Fallout 4, and every Fallout game, there are vaults that were built to shelter people from nuclear annihilation while also doing experiments on people as well. 
In Fallout 4, there are 7 total vaults, including ones added in DLCs, and they all have different backstories or experiments that went on in them. Some are places where people live, while some are eerie places where the player can explore what went down in them, and one even has robot vault dwellers. No Karma refers to the fact that, unlike previous Fallout games, Fallout 4 has no Karma system implemented into it. Ultimately, No Karma system makes a lot of the dialogue options and decisions that you make to do the quests basically useless, though they can still be fun, and there's less of an RPG element to 4 than there is to, say, New Vegas or even Fallout 3. No Karma system kind of takes away from the game a bit, as it's fun to roleplay as either evil or good characters, especially in the older Fallout games, and it's interesting how characters react to you based off of Karma, but that doesn't really happen in Fallout 4. Oh well. There are mods you can download to try to implement it, though. Cut content refers to the fact that a lot of the things that were meant to be implemented or were considered to be implemented were never added to the game. There are cut missions, cut characters and voice lines, cut weapons, and a lot, lot more. Some things exist in the files and are able to be restored, while others are not. As we go further down, we will discuss more cut content in specifics. Ghouls, super mutants, raiders, and robots is just referring to staple Fallout recurring characters, enemies, or more. From basically the first Fallout, there were these things, and they each play different roles in the wasteland, from California all the way to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's basically all for this entry, I just wanted to include it here. Another settlement that needs help is already giving me flashbacks honestly, and it refers to once you join the Minutemen, Preston Garvey will forever give you endless missions to help people in the name of protecting the Commonwealth. Uh, it became a meme essentially since the game came out, and it's seen as something very, very annoying. The quests are never ending, and the settlements are finite, so eventually you will be helping the same settlements out over and over again too. There is a way to cheese it though, so they won't appear on your pit boy by just talking to Preston after helping a settlement, then breaking an engagement with him, and walking away before he can give you another mission, but it's still annoying nonetheless. I, I hate it. So what do you plan on doing about the jet problem in our community? How about the settlement problem? Another settlement needs our help. I'll mark it on your map. Good Neighbor and Diamond City are the two biggest cities slash settlements in the game. The main story will take you through both of them many times each, and they are both located in or around the main city of Boston. Diamond City is in the old Red Sox Stadium, and there are houses and shops built in and around the fields and stands. The city is relatively stable, except for corruption on the mayor's part and other things hidden below the surface, but it's a good place to barter with traders. Good Neighbor is a town inhabited by more of a rough crowd of chem addicts and criminals. It's run by Hancock, the companion I mentioned earlier, and it is a place where crime is more prevalent and where ghouls can live in relative peace as they are not allowed in Diamond City. Settlement building is something introduced in Fallout 4, and it allows you to build settlements with growing populations all around the Commonwealth. It allows for storage, houses, defenses, and more to be built. And I kind of suck at building cool settlements, but there are people out there that can honestly build crazy good and insane settlements with so many NPCs inhabiting them. It is, in my opinion, a cool feature that Bethesda added to the game, and it's a fun side thing to do besides missions all the time. Power Armor and Power Armor Changes just refers to the differences in how Power Armor was previously and what it became in Fallout 4. Before in Fallout 3 in New Vegas, for example, you needed Power Armor training to even use Power Armor, and it was usually gained through joining a group that specializes in using said Power Armor, like the Brotherhood of Steel. In Fallout 4, things changed. All you need to use Power Armor is a Fusion Core, and that's about it. Fusion Cores being the new power source needed to run this Power Armor. Power Armor became something less rare, for lack of a better word, and became a different type of walking tank suit. And honestly, hate me all you want, but I think I might prefer Power Armor in Fallout 4. Ending Tier 1, we have DLC. We will get into the bigger DLCs later on, down the iceberg, but Fallout 4 has 6 total DLCs. 3 of them are more focused on settlement building and the like, and those are Contraptions, Vault Tech Workshop, and Wasteland DLCs, while the other 3 are story driven, Far Harbor, and Nuka World, which we'll get into soon, and Automatron, which has a main questline while also adding robot building to it too. It is a blend of the two forms really, and has you track down the Mechanist, a callback to Fallout 3, though a different character altogether, and culminates in a big confrontation between yourself and the Mechanist. The DLC also allows you to wildly customize and build robots, and lets you mix and match different parts of robots and build really whatever robot you want. It's pretty cool, but short DLC. I like it. Beginning Tier 2, we have the Mysterious Stranger. The Mysterious Stranger has appeared in multiple Fallout games, including 4, but he is an unknown NPC that will randomly appear when you use VATS, or the Vault Tech automated targeting system. He wears a trench coat and a hat usually, and uses a revolver to deal a huge amount of damage to enemies. He's able to be used through a perk, and it just adds a little extra something to the game. In Fallout 4, some players will comment on his appearance, which we will talk about further down the iceberg. Dance is a synth is that secret I mentioned while doing the companion's entry, 
and he was replaced by the Institute while recon team was out in the Commonwealth before the main body of the Brotherhood of Steel arrived. He did not even know he was a synth until the player finds out by scanning the Institute network for the Brotherhood of Steel as his memory was wiped. You are given the orders to kill him as the Brotherhood despises synths, but ultimately you have a choice to let him live or not still. He runs away and disappears after the Brotherhood finds out he is one, and it's up to you to track him down and find him, and decide his fate too. Kid in a Fridge is honestly a very well-known side mission in Fallout 4, and is liked by many as it's funny, has a cool premise, and has just the right level of obscurity. Around the south of the Fallout 4 map, near Quincy, you'll hear a kid's voice coming from a fridge. Upon a closer look and bashing or shooting to get the fridge open, you'll find Billy, a child ghoul that has been trapped in the fridge for 200 years. You have to get him home to hopefully find his family, but on the way home, you're stopped by a gunner named Bullet who offers to buy the kid for money. You can deny it if you do, once returning Billy home, the gunners will attack and you have to defend Billy and his parents that are miraculously still alive from an attack. And this quest kind of messed up ghoul lore and fallout, which granted was never really thoroughly established, but it was the first real appearance of a ghoul child and it also explained that they don't need to eat, though Billy needed to drink apparently from water droplets in the fridge. After that, the show just came out and made some more ghoul questions like do ghouls need to take drugs or chems to stop from turning feral? But anyway, that is the quest, and we'll discuss what gunners are in a few entries. Nuka World is a DLC based off the popular soft drink of the Fallout universe, Nuka Cola. The Nuka World DLC has you first take a train and run through a deadly gauntlet to ultimately become the overboss or the leader of the theme park, which houses three competing raider clans the Operators, the Disciples, and the Pack. The Operators, a faction focused on wealth and luxury, specialize in business dealings and high tech equipment. The Disciples are a group that focus on brutality and terror, using vicious melee weapons and stealth tactics. And lastly, the Pack. They embrace a wild and primal lifestyle, prioritizing strength and dominance through sheer force. In Nuka World, you are tasked with running the amusement park and dealing with problems that arise in it and with the competing clans. There are a lot of mysteries and weird things in and around the park as well, which we will discuss eventually. And also, if you want the Minutemen to continue liking you, uh, you better not side with a single one of these clans. You better kill them all. Far Harbor is the other big story DLC of Fallout 4 besides Nuka World, and Far Harbor has you initially go north to Maine to search for a runaway girl after getting hired through the Valentine Detective Agency and the goal is to bring her home. Once arriving though, you're sucked into the world of the fog-covered island, and you're left dealing with three groups trying to survive on the island. The first group is the town of Far Harbor itself, a group of people that have been pushed to the edge of the island onto a dock due to hostile enemies, growing danger from the fog, and conflict with other groups. The second group is the group where the girl, Kasumi Nakano, ran off to. That is, Arcadia, and it is a synth refuge where escaped synths of the Institute run off to, to find peace and safety. They are led by a synth named Dima, who looks a lot like Nick Valentine, and, spoiler alert, her brother robots, and Dima essentially wields the most power on the island with nuclear codes, secrets, and more. The third group is a group also present in the Commonwealth, in the Glowing Sea area, the Children of Adam. They are located in an old sub-base called the Nucleus, and their goal is to spread Adam's glory. There are also new creatures on the island that are honestly really cool, like school bus, giant hermit crabs, and more epic stuff like that. And there are also countless ways it seems to end the DLC, and it is honestly probably the best Fallout 4 DLC. The story is honestly amazing, and you should play it for yourself if you've not. I recommend it highly. Now we have Gunners finally, and Gunners are a mercenary group who are mainly located in the south of the Commonwealth, and they have a military structure and use more advanced and better weapons than the typical raider groups. They don't really have a huge backstory to why they do what they do or where they come from, similar to another mercenary group from Fallout 3, Talon Company, but through terminal entries and notes, it's found out that they're basically just a group that gets hired by others to fulfill tasks. Other than that, there's really nothing more on them of note. Um, they have good weapons and are usually encountered in the higher levels of the game, but you can encounter them as soon as you want to if you just head south. A new robot type introduced in Fallout 4, we have the Assault Trons, and Assault Trons were originally developed by the Varabco Corporation for use in the military and security applications before the Great War. They were designed to be versatile combat robots capable of engaging enemies in various combat scenarios, and after the Great War, Assault Trons were often taken by groups who repurposed them into what they needed. They're strong attackers, especially with their head laser beam thing that is basically an insta-kill in most cases, that thing's a pain in the ass. And they also seemingly resemble solely women, but from what I can tell, that's just because their power storage is in their chest, and it was the only spot that worked. So they probably aren't women, but some, like Cleo and Good Neighbor, claim that they are. Uh, they're robots, so they're neither really. And also, if you search these things up on Google, you're going to be finding some, some images. I'll just let you know. New Creatures just refers to the fact that Fallout 4, like every Fallout game before it, 
added a good amount of new creatures. Like the previous mentioned entry, Assaultrons are new, but so are a lot of other things. There is the Myrlurk Queen, for instance. Also, Myrlurks themselves appear to have been changed in design. There are mutant hounds, which now accompany their super mutant leaders. Bloodbugs, Myrlurk Kings, completely changed. Myrlurk Hunters, among many, many more new things were added to the game. New Ghouls builds on the last entry as well, and in Fallout 4, there were a couple new forms of the enemies known as Ghouls added too. You have the staples like Feral Ghouls and Feral Ghoul Reavers, but new ones like Bloated Ghouls, Charred Feral Ghouls, Fog Ghouls, Withered Feral Ghouls, plus probably more I'm forgetting, there's like a ton of them. So, yeah, new Ghouls. Legendary Weapons, Creatures, NPCs refers to a new game mechanic that was added with the release of Fallout 4. Those mentioned things can come in legendary variants and can mutate when around half health to regenerate their health and continue attacking when it comes to the creatures and NPCs. Upon their death, they drop weapons or apparel that have special legendary effects on them, and there are legendary effects like explosive rounds, guns that harm super mutants by and out of 15%, clothing that resists super mutants, clothing that increases sprint, and there's basically an endless amount of combinations of things and legendary effects. It's basically RNG and leads into the next entry of unique weapons and armor. The older Fallout games had them as well, but Fallout 4 does them a bit differently. These unique objects, like Grognox Axe for example, are located in a set location like they would be in the older Fallout games, but they also come with a legendary effect onto them already, instead of just different damage models. People complain about Fallout 4 doing away with unique items like they used to, but they're still in the game, just minorly different. Uh, unique clothing and armor honestly help to make the game feel a bit more roleplaying like, which this game does need a lot. Virgil, or Brian Virgil, is a significant character in Fallout 4, particularly in relation to the game's main storyline, which is why he's on Tier 2, and his relation to the search for the Institute. He's a former Institute scientist who defected after becoming disillusioned with their methods and goals. Virgil's research into reversing the effects of FEV, or forced evolutionary virus, on himself led to his transformation into a super mutant. Despite his appearance, he retains his intelligence, which is more rare for a super mutant, and he helps the player character by providing crucial info and assistance in infiltrating the Institute. He resides in a very remote cave in the Glowing Sea, which we mentioned earlier a bit, but it's an area which is heavily irradiated with strong high-level creatures and is where the bombs initially fell. Virgil helps the player find out how to get into the Institute and how to track down what is needed to teleport into the Institute. Ending Tier 2, we have Liberty Prime, also a part of the main story. And Liberty Prime is a massive humanoid robot built by the United States military before the Great War. It's an iconic symbol of American military might and patriotism built to combat communism during the Sino-American War. He stands several stories tall and is armed with powerful mini-nuclear bombs. In Fallout 4, the Brotherhood of Steel restores and reactivates Liberty Prime as a weapon against the Institute, utilizing its immense firepower and advanced targeting systems to aid in their campaign to eradicate their enemies. Its presence significantly shifts the tide of conflict in favor of the Brotherhood as it demolishes enemy fortifications and clears the way for their forces to advance. Liberty Prime also appears in Fallout 3, but was broken up by the Enclave in the Broken Steel DLC of that game. Right before the final quest for the Brotherhood, you are tasked with helping rebuild him by Proctor Ingram. Starting Tier 3, we have Chinese Submarine, and in Fallout 4, players can explore a partially sunken Chinese submarine located off the coast of the Commonwealth known as the Yangtze 31. It serves as a unique and intriguing location filled with stories and characters of what the Fallout world pre-war conflict between the United States and China looked and acted like. Players have the opportunity to interact with its sole remaining inhabitant that's not a feral ghoul, Captain Zhao. Zhao is a ghoulified Chinese submarine captain who has spent centuries trapped inside the vessel, grappling with his past and seeking redemption for his role in the war. Interacting with Zhao and exploring the submarine allows players to ultimately decide the fate of Captain Zhao and the Yangtze 31. If you side with him and help him out, you will be rewarded by him allowing you to essentially call in mini-nuke airstrikes. In Fallout 4, the USS Constitution is a historic naval vessel that has been preserved and maintained by a unique crew of robots led by the charismatic Captain Ironsides. Despite being centuries old, the USS Constitution is still seaworthy thanks to the efforts of its robotic crew, who have tirelessly repaired and upgraded the ship over the years. Captain Ironsides enlists the player's help in acquiring the necessary parts to repair the ship and to continue its mission to reach the Atlantic Ocean, though ultimately after using rockets to fly through the sky, it gets lodged atop a building in downtown Boston. And ultimately, the mission has you siding with the silly robots, or scavengers, but why the hell wouldn't you side with the silly robots? You get a handheld cannon. That's ultimately not that good, but it's still cool. In Fallout 4, the Cabot House is a mysterious mansion located in the Beacon Hill neighborhood of Boston. It serves as the residence of the enigmatic Cabot family, who are central to one of the game's biggest side quests, the secret of the Cabot House. Randomly encountering a ghoul named Deegan, usually at Bunker Hill, 
He will tell you of the Cabot House and their mission that is one of the weirder ones of Fallout 4. Upon arrival, they discover that the Cabot family has been involved in a centuries-old conflict with a powerful entity slash their possessed father known as Lorenzo, who possesses psychic abilities. The family has managed to keep Lorenzo imprisoned beneath an insane asylum for generations, using a mysterious substance called Mysterious Serum to prolong all of their lives. The player is presented with choices that can ultimately determine the fate of the family and their imprisoned patriarch. It has references to the Exorcist movie, and the demonic entities and the backstory surrounding them is similar. The Children of Adam, which we mentioned previously, are a side group in Fallout 4, though they are also in another Fallout game as well, and they worship the power of radiation and believe that it holds the key to enlightenment and transcendence. The Children of Adam are known for their distinctive robes and fervent devotion to their beliefs, and they see radiation not as a destructive force, but as a divine energy that cleanses and purifies the world. This belief leads them to seek out sources of radiation and even willingly expose themselves to it, believing that it brings them closer to their god, Adam. Throughout Fallout 4, players can interact with the children of Adam, learning more about their beliefs and becoming involved in their activities and conflicts, even being able to join them in the DLC Far Harbor. Rare Encounters does not refer to anything specifically, but a more general entry, and Rare Encounters are unique events that can occur in Fallout. They can range from being semi-regular and even pretty common encounters to ones that have an extremely low chance of happening. For example, a more common one is the alien spaceship, which at around level 20 in Fallout 4 will crash near the Beantown Brewery, and if you investigate it, it will lead you to killing an alien and obtaining the alien blaster pistol. A more rare one is with Gruul, a raider chef who I have personally never encountered, but he has a chef's hat and does not talk. Upon killing him, you find his interesting food shopping list that includes a cup of glowing ghoul blood. The Pillars of the Community is another side group in Fallout 4 that is encountered most likely during the Cabot House quests. They are a cult-like organization led by Brother Thomas, and they operate out of the Charles View Amphitheater in Boston. The group preys on vulnerable wastelanders, promising enlightenment and community in exchange for their belongings, where they basically just rob the people for money and let them wear suits and be members. When the player encounters the group, Brother Thomas attempts to recruit them by having them participate in a cleansing ritual, which involves relinquishing all of their possessions. If the player complies, they quickly realize that the group's true intentions are to rob and exploit new recruits. Players can choose to confront Thomas and his followers, exposing their scam and potentially recovering their lost items, or they can probably just kill them all, which I would wager is what most people do. Bunker Hill is a key location of Fallout 4, situated in the northeastern part of the city of Boston. It's a trading hub and settlement built around the historic Bunker Hill Monument, run by a merchant named Kessler. Bunker Hill serves as a safe haven for traders, caravans, and travelers. The site is significant for its role in the main storyline, particularly during the quest The Battle of Bunker Hill, where multiple factions, the Institute, the Railroad, the Brotherhood of Steel, and the Minutemen, can clash in a pivotal battle. This confrontation can be influenced by the player's choices and allegiances, impacting the game's story to be more tailored to your choices. In Fallout 4, several characters from previous Fallout games make a return, most notably from the game Fallout 3. First, Elder Maxon, the leader of the Brotherhood in Fallout 4, was originally in 3 and was a young child in the group. McCready, a companion in Fallout 4, was also in Fallout 3, living in the cave town slash settlement of Little Lamplight. Sierra Petrovita, a crazy fan of Nuka Cola, appears in Fallout 3 originally, but with the DLC of Fallout 4, Nuka World, she appears as well, searching for hidden symbols. Liberty Prime, the robot we already talked about, Dr. Madison Lee, who works for the Institute, is in 4, where she originally worked for the Brotherhood in 3, and she is able to be persuaded to rejoin the Brotherhood. Dogmeat, in name only, reappears. The Mysterious Stranger appears, of course, again. And other characters are mentioned as well, like 3Dog, the radio broadcaster of Fallout 3. I'm probably forgetting a couple, too. In Fallout 4, Swan is a unique super mutant behemoth encountered in Boston Common. Formerly known as Edgar Swan, he was a member of the Institute who was subjected to cruel experiments that transformed him into said behemoth. He was exiled to the Boston Commons, where he roams the area, often hiding beneath the surface of the Swan Pond. Swan is distinguished by his size, increased strength, and the makeshift armor he wears, adorned with remnants of Swan boats. And when players approach his territory, Swan emerges from the water, attacking with powerful melee strikes and throwing large rocks. Defeating Swan rewards the player with valuable loot, including a unique, powerful power fist. The Quincy Massacre is an event in the backstory of Fallout 4 particularly significant to the Minutemen faction. It occurred in the settlement of Quincy, where the Minutemen were called to defend the town against a massive attack led by the Gunners. 
Despite the Minutemen's efforts, the defense of Quincy failed disastrously, and the gunners overwhelmed the defenders, resulting in heavy casualties among the Minutemen and the slaughter of many innocent settlers. This defeat led to a severe loss of morale and credibility for the Minutemen, causing the faction to fracture and fall into disarray. Key characters like Preston Garvey, one of the few surviving Minutemen, witnessed the massacre firsthand, and the event serves as a driving force for Garvey's dedication to rebuilding the Minutemen and restoring their former glory. If the player returns to Quincy and takes out the gunners, you can find terminals and things belonging to people like Garvey and Sturgis. Mentioned in the Bunker Hill entry itself, the more specific Battle of Bunker Hill is a significant quest and event in Fallout 4's main storyline involving a clash between multiple potential factions, the four main factions. This battle takes place at the historic Bunker Hill settlement and revolves around a group of synths who have escaped from the Institute and are being protected by the railroad. Here is how the four main groups react to the battle. The Institute seeks to reclaim the escaped synths, considering them property. They deploy a team of synths and coarser operatives to retrieve them. The railroad, dedicated to helping synths escape the Institute and gain their freedom, the railroad fights to protect the synths at Bunker Hill from being recaptured. The Brotherhood of Steel, intent on eliminating the synth threat, engages in the battle to destroy the escaped synths and weaken both the Institute and the railroad. The Minutemen, if the player has aligned with the Minutemen, can call upon their forces to participate in the battle, aiming to protect the settlers and maintain peace in the Commonwealth, and depending on the player's decisions and allegiances, the battle can end in multiple ways, influencing the game's narrative and the player's relationships with the factions involved. In Fallout 4, players can find and play several retro-style minigames on their Pip-Boy, and these include Red Menace, a game reminiscent of Donkey Kong where players navigate a series of platforms, ladders, and obstacles to rescue a captive from an enemy at the top of the screen. The player must avoid falling barrels and other hazards to succeed, just like Donkey Kong. Atomic Command, similar to the classic game Missile Command, players defend cities from incoming nuclear missiles, and the objective is to shoot down the missiles before they can destroy the player's cities, protecting the population and maximizing the score. Zeta Invaders, a take on Space Invaders, players control a turret at the bottom of the screen and must shoot down waves of descending alien invaders before they reach the ground. Grognak and the Ruby Ruins, an RPG-style game where players navigate a top-down world as the barbarian hero Grognak, the game involves exploring dungeons, fighting monsters, and collecting treasures. Pipfall, a game inspired by Pitfall, where players guide a character through a series of side-scrolling jungle environments. The objective is to avoid obstacles such as pits and crocodiles while collecting treasures along the way. Ending Tier 3, we have the Vault Tech Representative. The Vault Tech Rep first appears at the protagonist's home in Sanctuary Hills just before the bombs drop. He is a door to door salesman for Vault Tech, offering the protagonist's family a spot in Vault 111. He is presumed to have died at the start of the game once the bombs went off, and he was not allowed in the vault. But he is actually still living as a ghoul, and he is able to be found when the player goes to the top floor of the Hotel Rexford in Good Neighbor. He is shocked to see you, and the player is able to send him to one of the many potential settlements in the game. It's a cool little feature that is honestly very easily missed. Starting Tier 4, we have the Atom Cats. The Atom Cats are a unique faction in Fallout 4, characterized by their 1950s greaser aesthetic and their passion for power armor. The Atom Cats are based in the Atom Cats Garage, a settlement located in the southeastern part of the Commonwealth, and members of the Atom Cats wear leather jackets and other greaser style clothing, often adorned with custom decals and designs. Their power armor is similarly customized, making them stand out visually, like a hot rod of the 1950s, and the members like Zeke, the leader, and Rowdy, who handles business along with the others, are all very minor really, and they just exist to add more intrigue to the Fallout world, and unfortunately, they do not have a big quest line or side quest that goes along with them, though it would be cool. Fake Preston refers to a deceptive encounter, where the player may encounter a character posing as the real Preston Garvey, and this impersonator typically approaches the player with a request for help, mirroring Preston's usual, and honestly at this point, infamous demeanor and mission style. Upon closer inspection or through dialogue options, players soon realize that this character is not the real Preston Garvey, but an imposter. If you have the real Preston Garvey with you, the encounter is even more unique through dialogue options and the like. Kate's accent refers to the fact that the companion Kate has a unique Irish accent not typically found in Boston. Her accent being Irish, while most of the other Wastelanders speak in a general Americanized accent, makes her stand out more and have theories of where she comes from. All that is known is that she had an abusive past with her parents and that they sold her into slavery, and that's basically all. There's never any dialogue that reveals if she actually comes from Ireland or not, but it's cool to imagine that she does, because Alistair Tenpenny from Fallout 3 comes from the ruins of Great Britain, so it's not entirely impossible for her to have come from Ireland. 
There are also other accents in the game as well, with, if memory serves me right, there being Scottish accents in the Far Harbor DLC among the dock workers. Or maybe I'm just delusional, I don't know. But I swear there's Scottish accents. The railroad and institute in Fallout 3 refers to the fact that, in Fallout 3, in Rivet City specifically, there's an available quest, The Replicated Man, where the two groups are mentioned. The quest involves a man working for the institute, Dr. Zimmer, tasking you with tracking down an android, also known as a synth, who has escaped the Commonwealth up north. After starting the quest, an NPC known as Victoria Watts will approach you, and she works for the railroad and tells you to let the replicated man and android remain free. If you accept her deal, she will give you the schematics for the railway rifle, and you can convince Dr. Zimmer that the android is dead, and you will be rewarded that way as well. Also, to spoil this over 15-year-old quest, the synth or android is Harkness of Rivet City. Commonwealth Super Mutants refers to the fact that Boston and the surrounding areas, Super Mutants do not come from the Master Out West or a vault in the Capital Wasteland, but they come from the Institute themselves. These Super Mutants were created in the Commonwealth through experiments conducted by the Institute using FEV. The Institute since often serve as test subjects for these experiments as well. They are a different size from the other two Super Mutant variations that we know of, and are of a different color as well with the ones from the Commonwealth being a more washed out looking green. They have less broken down skin and have less skin defects than the Capital Wasteland mutants, and they seem similar in appearance to the West Coast mutants kind of, though in my opinion the West Coast mutants seem to be a bit more intelligent on average. They also have mutant hound companions, a unique thing associated with the Commonwealth variant. I am purposely ignoring Fallout 76 by the way, I am not sure if the lore of that game is fully canon or partially or what, I don't know, I haven't played the game since it came out. Even though I heard it's good now, I'm probably still not going to play it. I'm sorry. In the Fallout universe, Zaytans are an extraterrestrial species commonly referred to as aliens, and Zaytans are typically depicted as small, green-skinned humanoid beings with large, almond-shaped black eyes and slender bodies. They resemble classic depictions of aliens in pop culture, and Zaytans are highly advanced technologically, possessing spacecraft capable of interstellar travel and advanced weaponry. Their technology often includes energy weapons and advanced medical equipment, and Zaytans appear sporadically throughout the Fallout series as rare encounters or easter eggs. Players can encounter them in specific locations, such as crash sites or hidden bunkers, where they may engage in combat or communication. Also iconic to game series is the weapon in which they commonly drop, the alien blaster. The motivations and intentions of Zaytans in the Fallout universe are often mysterious and open to interpretation. They are portrayed as enigmatic beings with their own agenda, which sometimes involves experimentation on humans or other creatures. They have a whole DLC about them in Fallout 3 as well, if you are interested, called Mothership Zeta. Brotherhood Go West for the show refers to the fact that, in the new TV show that recently came out, the East Coast Brotherhood flew across essentially the entire United States. The Pridwin, the ship from Fallout 4, makes an appearance, even though it was originally said to be another ship. Uh, that is false, as the name of the ship is visible in the show. It can be assumed they headed west in search of pre-war technology, I guess, though Maxent never makes an appearance in the show, at least not yet, and it's never explicitly stated why they are there in the first place. I guess we'll have to wait and see, and also if the show will acknowledge the West Coast Brotherhood at all, or if they are even still around. Bethesda really loves making the Brotherhood ever present. Kellogg still alive with Nick refers to, in the main quest of Fallout 4, Nick Valentine, the synth, has Kellogg's memories uploaded into his brain after Kellogg is killed and the synth component inside his head was retrieved. After the memory sequence, Nick bugs out for a second and speaks in Kellogg's voice, and this leads to the question of, is Kellogg still alive in the mind of another robot, and to what extent, if at all, is he alive inside Nick? Synth Mare is talking about the fact that the synth-hating town of Diamond City is secretly ran by a synth, Mare McDonough. Through gameplay and dialogue choices, players can uncover Mare McDonough's true identity as a synth and decide how to handle this revelation, potentially influencing Diamond City's future leadership. That's all really, it's just a tiny side quest that you get just from being in Diamond City enough. Something else you probably get from being in Diamond City enough. Located in the northeast part of the Commonwealth, near the town of Salem, a museum of witchcraft is housed in a historic building reminiscent of early American architecture. The museum's interior is dark and eerie, and filled with unsettling displays including artifacts relating to witch trials and folklore. The atmosphere is enhanced by dim lighting, creepy ambient sounds, and the remnants of a battle that took place within. Players visit the Museum of Witchcraft as part of the quest The Devil's Do, and they are tasked with investigating the disappearance of a caravan and retrieving a mysterious artifact rumored to be inside the museum. Upon entering and making your way through, the player is tasked to fight a deathclaw and to take a deathclaw egg from a corpse. You can decide to sell this egg to rich people in Diamond City, 
or you can return the egg to its mother and receive a Deathclaw Gauntlet weapon from the mother itself. Silver Shroud and Grognak refer to comic book characters that the player can essentially embody. Grognak's axe is able to be used as a pretty effective melee weapon that inflicts bleed, and his outfit can also be worn, though he has no side quests pertaining to him, and the Silver Shroud outfit and gun make it so that you can access unique dialogue choices and situations. The Silver Shroud quest being one of the more memorable side quests in the game, where you work for a ghoul obsessed with the shroud and you become a crime fighter fighting bad guys with humorous dialogue choices. Ending tier 4, we have Assault Rifle Change, and this is something people like myself and other Fallout fans probably find dumb, and it's that they changed the Assault Rifles from Fallout 3 and New Vegas, and made them into something different in Fallout 4. The new Assault Rifles being huge, bulky, water-cooled looking machine guns that are oftentimes pretty mid-looking, and as far as I know, there was never any lore change or explanation given as to why the Assault Rifles are now something different, and there likely never will be. Also, this is something similar to the handedness of the guns in Fallout 4 that we will discuss further down the iceberg as well. Starting Tier 5, we have General Atomics Galleria, and General Atomics Galleria is a painfully underutilized location in the north of the Commonwealth, and the Galleria is a pre-war shopping mall turned into a fully automated commercial center by General Atomics International, a company that designed robots pre-war. The Galleria is populated entirely by robots, each programmed to perform specific roles such as shopkeepers, entertainers, security guards, and maintenance personnel. You can lie and become the head of the area, but other than that, there's basically nothing else to do with the Galleria besides fight and box a robot. Ballistic Weave is an armor mod in Fallout 4, and the reason it's this far down is because who the hell ever sides with the railroad long enough to get this mod? That's a joke, by the way. But Ballistic Weave allows players to wear fashionable clothing or outfits while still enjoying the defensive benefits comparable to heavy armor, without the weight or restrictions, and it's honestly very good in terms of usage. New Vegas References refers to the fact that there are a couple references to New Vegas, an Obsidian-made game in a Bethesda-made game, Fallout 4. There is a note in the Valentine Detective Agency about the mysterious stranger being seen out west, Kellogg's Memories mentions San Francisco and general life out in NCR territory, and Robert House being indirectly mentioned as well. Also, in the Cabot House quest, there is talk of Jack Cabot going out west to search for ruins and lost cities. Perhaps Shady Sands? I don't know. Have any of you guys seen the show? But there's also unofficial mods to remake the game of New Vegas in Fallout 4's engine, but with the next-gen update ruining a lot of mod compatibility, it's unknown the status of said mod. Pikmin's Gallery is a location in Fallout 4 where a serial killer slash artist resides. It is in the northeast of the city of Boston proper, and upon investigation, the player will find the house occupied by raiders who want to kill Pikmin. Making your way through the house, the player ultimately rescues Pikmin from the raiders, and instead of him killing you, gives you a key to a safe which holds his knife, which inflicts bleed on opponents. It is one of a couple serial killer stories in the Fallout franchise. References refers to the minor references that are found all over the world of Fallout, not just in Fallout 4, but that reference TV shows, movies, songs, etc. And like in Fallout 4, a bar can be found with skeletons that represent the show Cheers, which also takes place in Boston. The whole Dunwich and Kazakh horror mythos being Fallout references Lovecraft, among many other things that are all references. Fallout is full of them, and it's part of what makes Fallout Fallout, and I could literally talk for hours about all of them, so we'll cut it short here, and I'll link the wiki in the description where it has many cultural references. There's literally hundreds, I think. The Fence Phantom refers to a mysterious entity or urban legend slash hero killer in Fallout 4, specifically associated with the Back Bay Fens area in Boston. According to reports and stories within the game, the Phantom is described as a spectral figure that appears suddenly and disappears just as quickly, often leaving witnesses unsettled and scared. Players may come across terminals or hear stories or even skeletons from NPCs about sightings or encounters with the Fens Phantom while exploring the Back Bay Fens Park area. Enclave refers to the fact that the Enclave, the remnants of the pre-war government of the United States, returns in Fallout 4. The Bethesda and Fallout staple made a return in the very recent next generation update for the next generation of consoles, the Xbox Series X, S, and PlayStation 5. I'm unsure if it's actual lore why they're there, or if it's just a little reference adding them for fun. Deacon stalks you refers to the fact that the railroad agent and potential companion, Deacon, follows you throughout the game before you ever even meet the railroad. He can be found unnamed in places like Bunker Hill giving basic interactions, and players with sharp eyes have definitely noticed him standing there, probably taking notes on you. Deacon also talks about plastic surgery and how he's a synth, so maybe even when his NPC model is not there, he may still be stalking you. He's a creep. 
The Mechanist is a character in Fallout 4 who also appears in Fallout 3, though as a different person. But the Mechanist appears in the Automatron DLC of Fallout 4, and the Mechanist controls a robot army that roams the wasteland. And in the DLC, it is the player's job to side with another robot, Ada, and to track down the Mechanist, ultimately coming to a final confrontation with the Mechanist in her lair. Yes, I said her, the Mechanist is now a girl. In Fallout 3, it was a dude in a little town, and he was fighting the Antagonizer, and it was basically robots versus bugs on a very small scale. I assume the Mechanist is just a costume, or maybe it's a mantle that a person takes up. Who truly knows? It's pretty cool though. Ending Tier 5, Nick and the Mysterious Stranger is talking about how, as previously mentioned, there was a mention of the Stranger in the detective agency as Nick is trying to track down the Stranger and find out who he is. And also, on top of that, when the Stranger appears, Nick will sometimes say something about it. Also, I'm just saying, mostly joking, but just saying, both characters wear a fedora and trench coat, so maybe Nick is modeled after the Stranger or is a prototype of one, as they can maybe be synths from the Institute, and that's the reason why there's so many Mysterious Strangers? Who knows? Starting Tier 6, we have left-handed guns. In Fallout 4, not 3, or New Vegas, guns like the hunting rifles are left-handed and the bolts are cycled so oddly as the gun is shouldered right-handed. I think this just comes down to whoever designed the models and animations had little idea about guns in general, but it's something of an oddity only in Fallout 4. And, well, 76 too, but we don't talk about that. Um, there are mods that fix it, but honestly after a while I just get used to it and accept it. Mannequins refers to, in Fallout 4, that mannequins are often found in humorous, scary, and random poses all over the world. This initially led to fan theories about them being alive, but the developers have said that it was just funny environment storytelling, which makes much more sense, but is a bit less intriguing. Beer Robot refers to a quest that is able to be done for the Hotel Rexford in which you track down a robot that serves beer for the hotel. Once found, it can be sent to the hotel or it can be sent to a settlement of your choosing, but painfully the quest gets softlocked if you send it to your settlement, and unless you use console commands to complete it on PC, you can never truly keep the beer robot. Like last entry being sad because you can't keep the beer robot, this entry, Norwegian Raiders talks about how there's a group of ghoulified raiders that exist in the Commonwealth that can only speak Norwegian, and it's sad because the group was shipwrecked during the Great War and as they could not speak English, they were targeted and forced to survive and defend themselves against outsiders. So in reality, they're not technically raiders, but were forced to become them. They reside on the FMS North Star in the southeastern section of the map, and they are hostile to all outsiders, including the player. If you are to look up what they're actually saying, it's sad because it's basically them saying things like, go away, or talking about going home upon their deaths. It's pretty sad. Bosco is the mascot and leader of the Raiders at the DB Technical High School, and he wears a half-destroyed bear's head that is one of the more unique items in Fallout 4 when it comes to clothing. And as per the Fallout wiki, Bosco is the leader of the Raiders established inside the DB Technical High School, who at one time was affiliated with the traitor Eleanor. Together with Cleaver and Tork, he successfully raided the Shamrock Tap House and struck a deal with its surviving inhabitants afterward, which was part of his ambitious plan to take over the downtown Boston area. During a follow-up raid at Backstreet Apparel, he was bitten on the hand by one of Torque's mongrels, after which he began to experience temper control issues, which led him to believe that the mongrel might have been carrying a disease, presumably rabies. His mental health started to decline, as he began to suspect that his gang members were poisoning the water sources around him, upon which he decided to take residence in the school's basement in order to access its safe water. Drifting further into a delusional state, he started to hallucinate about a fictional beast laying in wait, which he thought to be responsible for killing his men, leaving him trophies, and covering him in blood as he was sleeping. Later on, some of his men finally found the head of the beast, which turned out to be the school's mascot's bearhead. Bosco has worn the bearhead ever since, and given these events and Bosco's declining mental state and reclusive tendencies, it's heavily implied that Bosco himself was the beast, which was killing his own men. So yeah, a cool complex story about a pretty obscure raider. Cryolator in Fallout 3 refers to that the weapon first seen in Fallout 4 was supposed to be in Fallout 3 before that. The weapon was ultimately cut and originally had a different look, more so resembling the homemade weapons that can be made with schematics in that game, and only the texture of it exists and it is unable to be used with console commands or the like, but it is pretty cool looking. Wazer Wifle 3 and 4 is talking about the fact that in both games, a unique weapon exists called the Wazer Wifle. In both games, you acquire the rifle from a kid, and in Fallout 3, you get it from Bowie 
in Little Lamplight where he will sell it to you and in Fallout 4 you get it from Synth Child Sean who gives it to you if you rescue him from the destruction of the Institute. In Fallout 3, while identical in appearance to the regular laser rifles, it does 5 more damage and also comes with a larger magazine with 30 shots instead of the standard 24. It also has 80% more item HP than the standard laser rifle, and in Fallout 4 it is identical to a regular laser rifle but has a never ending effect so it fires from the reserve ammo instead of a magazine, so as long as you have ammo for it you never have to reload, but honestly there are better laser rifle variants in both games. Food paste refers to in Fallout 4 there's a pinkish paste that was meant for human consumption. Found in the Suffolk County Charter School, it was created by the American government during the pre-war years in conjunction with vault Tech Corporation. The food paste was meant to have all the required nutrients that a person needs to live, and it was said to have tasted delicious and have a shelf life exceeding 100 and even 200 years. Though the food paste had some detrimental effects, it did not taste good as attested by notes from people, even though official memos and terminals says that it did taste good. It turned the skin pink with prolonged consumption, and it caused high levels of irritability. The school is heavily populated by feral ghouls, which are also pink. The paste is a reference to the 80s movie, The Stuff, and while there are no quests relating to the food paste, it is fun to explore the dark story of the school. Brotherhood of Steel and Lions references the fact that in Fallout 4, the Brotherhood will mention two characters that appeared in Fallout 3, but not Fallout 4, Owen Lyons, the elder and leader of the Brotherhood in 3, and Sarah Lyons, his daughter. By the time of Fallout 4, their fate is shrouded in mystery and tragedy. Elder Owen Lyons diverged from the Brotherhood's primary mission of hoarding technology, instead focusing on protecting the people of the Wasteland, and Sarah Lyons led the elite fighting force known as Lyons' Pride. She was a capable and dedicated warrior, deeply committed to her father's vision and the Brotherhood's mission. Elder Owen Lyons passed away in the years between Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, and his death led to significant changes within the Brotherhood's leadership and direction and his daughter took over as Elder after his death, but the mystery surrounding his death and her story have led to many theories about what happened. Sarah disappeared under mysterious circumstances. The exact details of her fate are not fully explained in Fallout 4, and official records state that she died in battle, but the specifics remain ambiguous. After the deaths of the Lions, the Brotherhood's leadership reverted to more traditional and hardline elements led by Elder Arthur Maxon in Fallout 4. Under Maxon, the Brotherhood returned to its original mission of securing and controlling advanced technology. Perhaps Maxon and others in the Brotherhood did not like the shift, or they perhaps wanted control so they took out Sarah Lyons. Perhaps Maxon, who was young in Fallout 3, grew up being controlled by bad actors who influenced him. Ultimately, we cannot be sure as to what exactly happened, and we can only speculate. The phrase, Milk of Human Kindness, is famously used in Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and has been adopted into Fallout 4's dialogue through the character of Strong, a super mutant companion. And unlike most super mutants, Strong shows an unusual interest in human culture and philosophies largely due to his exposure to the teachings of his former companion Rex Goodman. When the player first meets Strong, he is imprisoned in Trinity Tower along with Rex Goodman, and Rex, a former actor, tried to teach Strong about human culture by reciting Shakespearean plays. Strong becomes fixated on the idea of finding the milk of human kindness, a phrase he heard from Rex's recitations. Strong's understanding of the phrase, milk of human kindness, is literal and not metaphorical. He believes it to be a physical substance that will grant him power. And while Strong does not have a direct quest to find the milk of human kindness, the only thing possibly relating is once you get his companion affinity high enough, the player can unlock Strong's perk, Berserk, which increases the player's melee damage by 20% and that's really all the milk of human kindness possibly could be. Ending tier 6 we have gorillas. In Fallout 4 which takes place in Boston and around that area generally the player can come across gorillas. The first encounter will likely be synth gorillas which can be found in the institute and they are just there as a cool little feature showing the advanced science that the institute can perform. Later on during the Nuka World DLC gorillas can also be found, this time real or at least it is assumed where they are living with a man named Sido, who we will soon cover. These gorillas are also non-aggressive and act as family for Sido, having been made intelligent by FEV before the Great War and having passed the smarts down through the years. The player helps them by getting rid of gator claws, death claw alligator hybrid things from where they live, and the raiders of Nuka World also want to take control of that area, and if you want to be nice you can convince them to leave the area or you can just kill the raiders and you can ultimately get them all killed if you want, even. Uh, poor monkeys if you do that, though, and you're kind of evil. Starting Tier 7, we have Frozen Head, which refers to the creator of Nuka-Cola, John Caleb Bradburton, 
a mashup of the creators of the real-life Coca-Cola and Pepsi, the frozen head can be found after completing the quest for Sierra Petrovita, the crazed Nuka-Cola superfan, and once finding the head, it begins to talk. He begs to be put out of his misery as his cryogenically frozen head has been lonely for hundreds of years. If the player does this, the player can get a special prototype weapon and ammo, the Nuka Nukes, which are fired from a fat man and create a giant blue mushroom cloud. The frozen head is inspired by the common myth and misconception that Walt Disney was cryogenically frozen upon his death. Trash Can Carla Spy refers to the fact that Trash Can Carla, a traveling merchant that can be found everywhere seemingly, is actually a spy, or probably one. She is evasive when asking her questions about her life, and if the player sides with the Institute during quests, she can oftentimes be found during fights involving the Institute showing that she could be sending info their way. For example, last time I played, she was at the Battle of Bunker Hill for no reason whatsoever. Maybe coincidence? Maybe not. While there is no direct evidence that she is a spy, there are a lot of small hints as to who she potentially is. FEV Cure is something that the scientist Virgil was working on when he was in the Institute and before he had to escape after becoming a super mutant. The cure reverses the effects of FEV and turns super mutants back into humans. During the main quest, the player can help Virgil by retrieving the cure serum and giving it back to Virgil, who after a while will become a normal human again. It leads to theories about maybe in the future there will be a cure for super mutants who want to become human again, though perhaps it would only work on super mutants who are more intelligent and not too far gone. Dunwich refers to the Dunwich Borers, a quarry and a location with a dark and mysterious backstory that pays homage to the works of H.P. Lovecraft, specifically his story, The Dunwich Horror. As the player explores Dunwich Borers, they will notice an eerie atmosphere and experience strange visions and hallucinations. The deeper the player goes into the quarry, the more intense and disturbing the visions become. These visions often depict scenes from before the Great War, hinting at dark rituals and otherworldly influences. At the deepest level of the quarry, players find a hidden sacrificial chamber that contains an altar and various artifacts, and this chamber is the source of the strange visions and is linked to the dark rituals performed by the pre-war workers. In the sacrificial chamber, players can find a unique melee weapon called Kremva's Tooth as well, an oddly shaped blade with poisoning effects. There are also Dunwich references in Fallout 3 as well, with places in Point Lookout and the Capital Wasteland. Underwater Civilization refers to a cut feature that was potentially going to be added to Fallout 4, a quest called 20 Leagues Under the Sea. Recreated and known with help from files from Fallout 76 and with repairing the Yangtze submarine, the player would join forces with Captain Zhao and sail the submarine over to Vault 120, where the vessel would end up smashing into the submarine bay of the vault. The precise circumstances of the crash remain unclear, but given the overt reference to Jules Verne, the author of the book with basically the same title, just 20,000 leagues under the sea instead of 20, and the presence of a sentient squid at the undersea vault, it was likely that the squid would play a major role, especially given that the squid would have been the overseer of Vault 120, the rest of the quest can be roughly plotted based on the Vault 120 cells found in Fallout 76 and the markers placed inside them combined with leftover scripts in Fallout 4. There was also an underwater sphere and pipings left in the game that can be found, and it shows that the quest was likely scrapped late in development. It would be cool to have sentient annals again in Fallout being similar to Fallout 2 with the death claws, and while it may not have been a civilization underwater, it would have been a vault that was maybe going to help rebuild civilization after the bombs fell a la Fallout the TV show. Birds are synths is a theory that all or most of the birds that can be found in Fallout 4 are actually working for the Institute. It's not a super serious theory as you can kill them and no synth parts are found, but I think this theory just comes from the fact that in real life there is a joke conspiracy, or at least I think it's a joke conspiracy, that birds work for the government and that they are spies that give information about us over to the people in charge. World Series Bat refers to that in Jamaica Plain, a location in the southern area of the map, the 2076 World Series baseball bat for what one can only assume is the Boston Red Sox can be found. The bat is a legendary and unique weapon that has the rare chance to send an enemy ragdolling and flying away. Also, it kind of implies that the Red Sox had never won a World Series before this, dating all the way back to 1918, and the year after they finally won it again, the world blew up. Cedo is a unique character found in the Safari Adventure attraction within Nuka World, and he is a friendly and somewhat simple-minded individual who has lived most of his life in the park. Cedo was raised by his family, a group of intelligent gorillas created by pre-war scientists in Safari Adventure using FEV. Cedo speaks broken English and has a childlike innocence due to his isolation and upbringing in the park, and he cares deeply for his family of gorillas, and he wants to ensure their safety and well-being. That's all there really is to Cedo. he's cool. 
Fallout London and New Vegas mods refers to something I touched on a bit earlier, but they are just huge mods that use the Fallout 4 engine to tell a whole new story, and with a London mod in a whole new location as well. They take place where their names imply, but there are also other huge mods, such as ones that take you to New York City with the Brotherhood of Steel, and more. They are both unreleased at the time of the video, and with the next gen update breaking a lot of the mods, they may unfortunately take longer than expected. And of course, at least for the London and New York City mods, they are non-canon. Ending tier 7, we have Sturgis is a synth. Sturgis, a handyman and basically one of the smartest and most technical people that works with the Minutemen, is a person with not a whole lot of backstory. What is known is that he knows a lot about pre-war technology and knows how to seemingly use everything. And while he is unkillable in the game normally, if the player kills him with console commands, he drops a synth component. It is never confirmed whether it is a synth in the lore or not, but it's likely that he is if he drops it when killed. And coming up on the iceberg, we will hear of a group being paid by another group, and one of those groups was potentially involved with the Quincy Massacre, and perhaps Sturgis was the whistleblower on the whole thing. Starting Tier 8, our final tier, we have the Sea of Tranquility War. This war was a conflict that involved the United States sometime before the Great War, and involved an unknown party who they fought against on the moon, though probably China. Really, the only info we have on this war is that there's a mural in the Museum of Freedom depicting this war and saying it is another area where America has defended freedom and democracy. The mural reads, This mural commemorates the many sacrifices of the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces, from Lexington and Concord to the shores of Iwo Jima, from the Sea of Tranquility to the Anchorage front line. Americans have fought and died through the ages to secure our nation's freedom. May their sacrifices remind us all that freedom is a privilege afforded to the many, yet hard won by a noble few. It is uncertain whether it actually took place or was it just something that was theoretical, but that is legit basically the only info on it. Deacon is the Lone Wanderer is a semi-popular fan theory that says Deacon is the protagonist of Fallout 3. With Deacon's habit of changing identities and his secretive nature, it has led some players to theorize that he may have a deeper connection to previous protagonists. On a Reddit post, Khaleesi Mady says info showing that he could maybe be the Lone Wanderer is that Deacon seems to be about 29 to 30, just like the Lone Wanderer from Fallout 3 is. Canon-wise, it seems that the Lone Wanderer is a male. There is a fair bit of evidence from different dialogue from Dr. Lee and other people. Deacon can change his face whenever he wants, which shows that your character might be him, but he just changed his appearance. Canon-wise, they're seeking a high karma build, which means he helped during the Replicated Man quest, which means he is in good terms with the Railroad. Deacon has been in the Capital Wasteland and talked about the clean water it has. And lastly, Deacon is literally a wanderer. He's been in the Mojave Wasteland and in the Capital Wasteland. The guy who posted this did say he may have been drunk, but it is a cool theory nonetheless. The only thing is, really, you play and seemingly have memories of being a child in Fallout 3. And actually, I mean, if you're a synth, these may be fabricated memories. I don't know. Cool theory, though. Ghoul, Whale, and Far Harbor talks about a popular fan theory that was around when the game originally came out. Some NPCs mention a ghoul whale or a sea monster, so this naturally led players to speculate that there was actually a deadly ghoulified whale that was out hiding in the water. Unfortunately, no one was ever found, but the developers, being cool, did add the corpse of one to the Far Harbor DLC. All in all, it's just a cool thing the devs did after a fan mystery was created. Dogmeat Descendant is honestly a really cool theory. In the beginning of Fallout 4, in the pre-war scene, you can examine a dog bowl and the character mentions how your dog has sadly ran away. So after finding the actual dog meat at the Red Rocket, the theory is that your dog who ran away is the ancestor of the dog meat you find in the game. And I mean, it kind of makes total sense because dog meat is immediately attached to you and bonds with you and is loyal right away. I think it's a cool theory and I choose to believe it because I love dog meat. I don't care if it's actually true or not. Grenade Guy is an urban legend in Fallout that can be heard of when the player gets close to certain raider groups near Hardware Town and Trinity Tower. They tell of a guy who was lured into Hardware Town to be robbed and killed actually started throwing grenades everywhere, but in reality they were just rocks, and he began to make machine gun noises and stunning the raiders with his insane act. He left the building where he got onto a fake motorcycle, and making fake noises for that too, he ran away. Another group of raiders near Trinity Tower will also speak of Grenade Guy, and they say that while guarding their outpost while near Super Mutants, Grenade Guy appeared making loud motorcycle noises, stunning the mutants and the raiders alike. Both groups, too stunned to do anything, just watched as he threw a rock and made a grenade noise and rode off into the distance. That is all we ever hear of Grenade Guy, and unfortunately, we never get to meet him. 
Moriarty from Fallout 3 is Kate's dad is a theory that really exists for two reasons. First, they both have an Irish accent, being I think the only two characters with that, correct me if I'm wrong, and Liam Neeson voicing your dad in Fallout 3 doesn't count. But the second reason is because Moriarty is kind of an asshole, like Kate says her parents were, and maybe the reason he is alive in Fallout 3 is because Kate hadn't come back to kill him yet, and in between the events of Fallout 3 and 4, that is when she kills him. The theory is really just because of those two things, mainly the Irish thing, I think. Gunners funded by the Institute is where that Sturgis is a synth theory connects to. It's a theory that the mercenary group is fueled and paid for by the Institute. There's not a lot of info on this theory and it's only speculative, but the Gunners, who are very well equipped with technology more advanced than the other Wasteland groups, may very well be funded and supplied by the not so morally right Institute. Well, that's my opinion of them being not morally right. Uh, you can feel free to disagree with me in the comments if you want, but I think turning super mutants out loose into the Commonwealth is not really justifiable. But yeah, the theory is mainly just because the Gunners are well equipped with weapons and tech. So is the Institute and the Gunners do not have a lot of lore. Maybe it's just lazy writing on that part, or maybe it's a cool little story. You are a synth is a theory that the player character is really a synth and not human at all. It comes largely from Dima in Far Harbor asking you what your earliest memory is and the options do not allow for you to choose anything earlier than the Great War, like your time in the army. But Bethesda has stated that the player character is not a synth, so that theory is kind of proven false. Now for our final entry. Something terrifying, something so scary it is scarcely ever talked about. The Red Death. The Red Death, a creature from Far Harbor, takes down ships underwater and is said to be a giant legendary sea creature, and many more horrific things are said about it. With glowing red eyes, the player can choose to confront this beast, only if one does the quest for the mariner in Far Harbor, that is. She is dying of a disease and wants one final thing to go out on a high note. You help her with the Red Death. Be warned though, because the Red Death is truly terrifying and only high levels even have a chance of surviving for more than a brief second against it. Good luck. I bet you wish the Red Death was just a tiny little Mirelick or something dumb like that. Alright everyone, well that about does it for the Fallout 4 Iceberg. If you watched the whole thing, I truly thank you, and thank you for watching in general. If you want to like or subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it, though if not, that's cool too. I'm sure I missed a lot of things in this game. This game is huge and has so many things I could have included on the Iceberg, but I wanted the Iceberg to be semi-reasonable lengthwise. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. If you made it to the end, thank you for that too. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. I will see you sooner rather than later. Peace out, you beautiful people. Goodbye.